Critical care ultrasound, more than just line placement. Evaluation of shock. Objectives are to discuss the role of bedside ultrasound in the assessment and treatment of critically ill patients in shock. There's a strong case for use of bedside ultrasound in the clinical arena. Recently, the American Society of Echocardiographers created a consensus statement with American College of Emergency Physicians. They clearly stated, there's a focused cardiac ultrasound has become a fundamental tool to expedite the diagnostic evaluation of the patient at the bedside. The FATE protocol has been described as the focused assessed trans thoracic echo. There are several goals to the FATE protocol, which has been des described in a previous recording. The goals are to exclude obvious pathology, to assess wall thickness and chamber dimensions, also known as the static parameters of the heart, to assess contractility, or the dynamic measures, and to image the pleura bilaterally. But the key is to relate the findings into the clinical context. In the original article by Dr. Sloth et al., the results of incorporation of the FATE protocol into the intensive care unit were as follows. The FATE protocol provide, provided usable images that contributed positively to evaluation in 97% of patients. More than 37% of patients, their echoes revealed new information that hadn't previously been suspected. And in more than a quarter of the cases, the imaging was decisive in evaluation in terms of deciding a therapeutic path along which to send the patient. Let's talk a little bit about PA catheters. PA catheters can measure central venous pressure, pulmonary artery pressure, wedge pressure, calculate a cardiac output, calculate a systemic vascular resistance, and other phenomena such as tamponade, valvular issues. These days, we typically see the PA catheters being used in a few situations, one of which is the evaluation of undifferentiated shock. PA catheters, as we know, are invasive, and the clinical results we get depend on the knowledge and experience of the user. The questions we try to answer with PA catheters are why is the patient in shock? Also, what type of shock? or we use it in respiratory failure to determine cardiogenic versus non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And we also utilize PA catheters when we need to monitor our therapeutic interventions, such as volume, resuscitation, or pressors. In bedside ultrasound, what are the questions we can answer with bedside ultrasound? Mm -hmm. Well, these should look familiar. Pretty much the same questions that we try to answer with PA catheters are the ones we can answer with bedside ultrasound. There are a few exceptions. And what can we measure with bedside ultrasound? Well, we can estimate the central venous pressure from the inferior vena cava collapsibility. We can estimate pulmonary artery pressure from tricuspid regurgitation. Pulmonary capillary or wedge pressure, cardiac output can be calculated. Systemic vascular resistance can be calculated once you know the other parameters. And we can also assess for tamponade and valvular issues, pretty much the same things as a pulmonary artery catheter, and it has the added benefit of being non-invasive. Now we're going to talk primarily today about the RUSH protocol. The RUSH protocol is an acronym for Rapid Ultrasound in Shock. In 2010, this was a protocol that was described <coughs> about how to approach a patient who is critically ill and in shock. It essentially describes a three-step algorithm, which will, I will organize into three areas, the pump, or the heart in terms of contractility of the ventricles and effusions. The tank, how full is the tank? Is it leaking? Are there things impinging upon the tank and preload return, such as uh, pneumothorax? And the pipes, the major pipes of the body in terms of the aorta, as well as uh, deep venous thrombosis. Rapid ultrasound and shock. You can also think about it as high MAP, which is the goal when a patient's in shock is to hit a higher MAP. This would evaluate a patient who's in shock by thinking in terms of the heart, the IVC, Morrison's pouch, aorta and veins, and the pleura. And essentially this is the same thing as pump, tank, and pipes. It's just a different way of organizing your approach to the patient. And in the end, it doesn't really matter which 
method you choose as long as you approach the patient in a systematic way. A brief review of the categories of shock. We all should be familiar with hypovolemic shock, which is absolute hypovolemia of hemorrhage, dehydration, or GI losses. But there's also relative hypovolemia, sometimes <coughs> described as distributive shock, where the volume hasn't changed, but the tank got larger. And this could be in sepsis, adrenal insufficiency, neurogenic shock, and vasoplegic states. There's also cardiogenic shock. There's diastolic dysfunction, which we see in patients who've had long-standing hypertension and also tachycardia, but more often than not, when we're talking about shock, we're talking about systolic dysfunction. Global cardiomyopathies, Takotsubo's cardiomyopathies, uh, regional wall motion abnormalities due to ischemia, or structural issues such as valve failures. Finally, there's obstructive shock. The types of things that can impair cardiac output from impingement, either from without, uh, outside the heart or within, include hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, massive pleural effusion and ascites, tamponade, tension pneumothorax, and pulmonary embolus. So let's focus on the pump first. When we're thinking about cardiogenic shock, we can evaluate the left ventricle size and function qualitatively. And the eyeball method has been well documented as being very, very accurate when you compare it to quantitative methods. So here we have a normal left ventricular function where you see the walls thickening and coming towards the midline as compared to a moderately depressed and a severely depressed left ventricle. The, dis the evaluation of the ventricles is a separate discussion, but just briefly, when you look at the left ventricle, you should see an imaginary dot in the middle of the ventricle, all walls thickening and coming towards that dot. And the chamber size should change by 30 to 40 percent, just on the eyeball. Here's a larger view. Here we have the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And notice how the walls are all uniformly thickening and coming towards a imaginary spot in the middle of the ventricle. We can also assess the left ventricle from other views. This is the parasternal long axis view. And here what we're looking for qualitatively, qualitatively is the mitral valve hitting the septum. And this is essentially seen typically in normal left ventricular function states or hyperdynamic as well. The other areas we can look is back in the chamber. We look here to see if the chamber size is changing. We also look to see if the walls are thickening, both the septum and the infralateral wall. This would indicate normal left ventricular function. And keep this view in your mind when you move to the following parasternal long axis view. And you can definitely see the difference, even without a lot of training. You can see that this mitral valve is not coming up to hit the septum. And if you focus in this back area of the ventricle, there's not a significant amount of thickening of the walls, and there's not much change in the chamber size. So this is a poor cardiac function. Here's another example from the apical four chamber view. Focus on the septum here. The lateral wall is showing some thickening, but the septum seems to be swinging and doesn't seem to be coordinated. So this is really a disconnect septum. It's going in the opposite direction from where you would expect during systole. And likely this is a septum that is, uh, is down or dead from ischemia. Many times when you see uh, cardiogenic shock, you also see additional findings that support your diagnosis. One of a plethoric IBC, a full IBC without much respiratory variation and also pulmonary bead lines, which are the ultra ultrasound equivalent of uh, curly bead lines. People can become shocky, not just from left ventricular failure, but also from right ventricular failure. And how do we assess the right ventricle? Well, in general, the right ventricle is expected to be two-thirds the size of the left ventricle. That's normal. The right ventricle is also more triangular in shape and it contracts differently. Here you see where the tricuspid valve attaches to the lateral wall and what you notice is the tricuspid valve is moving towards the apex 
in this direction about two centimeters with each syst systolic excursion. We call this TAPSI, tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, and that's normal, about a two centimeter movement. We also focus on the fractional area change, or the change in the size of the triangle of the, left, of the right ventricle. Besides looking at the overall size of the ventricle and the movement of the tricuspid valve and a change in the size of the triangle, we also look at the apex, and the apex should be predominated, predominated by the left ventricle. Compare that to the second view. Apex is being shared by the right ventricle and the left ventricle. The tricuspid plane is moving some, but not a nice two centimeter excursion like in the normal picture. And the right ventricle is enlarged. So this is a uh, right ventricular failure picture in a patient in shock. In this final picture, you can see poor tapsy. Mm -hmm. You can see an enlarged right ventricle, same size as the left ventricle. But you also notice that the left ventricle is struggling in this picture, and this is a, an example of biventricular failure. A closer view. In the parasternal short axis view, we can assess the right ventricle fairly easily. Normally, the right ventricle is a crescent upon, uh, on top of the left ventricle, and the left ventricle should be circular. In this case, you can see significant right ventricular enlargement. And you also see paradoxical septal motion, meaning the septum is going towards the left ventricle during diastole when the mitral valve opens, and it should be going in the opposite direction, and this is due to pressure overload from the right side. You also have the D-shaped ventricle, D-shaped septum, due to the flattening of the pressure of the right side. All of these things are indicative of right ventricular dysfunction. So that's primarily the pump. Um, we will talk about pericardial tamponade in the obstructive section. But now let's talk more about the tank and the pipes. Now the main question we usually have in our shocky patients is, will they be volume responsive? And for that, we need to determine if they are on the steep part of the Frank Starling curve for their inotropic, inotropic function. So if a patient has poor systolic function versus a normal systolic function, there's a narrower window where they're on the steep part of the Starling curve. But don't forget that they can still be on the steep part of the Starling curve. So a patient who comes in who has baseline congestive heart failure still could be hypovolemic, and we do need to still assess for that and provide the appropriate volume challenge if it's indicated. Typically, we've looked at static parameters historically, including central venous pressure and IVC diameter. But we don't encourage that anymore, as it's been shown to not be predictive of volume responsiveness. Dynamic parameters, instead, we focus upon in ultrasound. This is a picture courtesy of Anne-Sophie Barreau from Stanford University. Here we see increased interthoracic pressure situation will decrease venous return. And in a spontaneously breathing patient, this would be during exhalation. And in a ventilated patient, this is during inhalation. On the right, you see when there is a relatively decreased interthoracic pressure, this enhances venous return. So if you think about Frank Starling curve, which basically predicts for a change in preload that you will change your stroke volume or cardiac output, if you have a patient whose breathing is affecting their stroke volume, then they are on the steep part of the Starling curve. And how do we tell that? Well, there are a few ways. We look at IVC distensibility index, delta velocity timed integral, delta V max, passive leg raise, and a qualitative sign called the kissing papillary sign. Subcostal IVC assessment, I've simplified this down here. There can be more detail to this chart. But in general, if you have a small inferior vena cava with more than 50% collapse, you have a central venous pressure probably less than 10. If you have a larger inferior vena cava, cava diameter with less than 50% collapse, your central venous pressure is probably greater than 10. And here's some qualitative assessments. This IVC is small and collapsible. Now here, over here, each one of these marks is a centimeter. So this is a possibly two centimeter with more than 50% collapse. But the CBP here in this patient was less than five. 
If you use end mode, which is motion mode, and place a line across your area of interest, you can watch everything that happens along that line over several seconds. Here, when you have a relatively elevated intrathoracic pressure, the, C the IVC is 2.79 centimeters. And here, where the intrathoracic pressure is relatively negative, you can see a collapse of the IVC down to 1.99 centimeters. But if you put this into calculation, this is a 30% change. So this is a greater than 2% greater than 2 centimeter IVC with less than 50% change. And this patient had a CVP that was in the 10 to 15 range. By comparison, here you have a large inferior vena cava with minimal respiratory variation. And the hepatic veins here are not distended. Central venous pressure is probably greater than 10, much greater than 10, but maybe not greater than 20, which is what we typically of the situation where we typically see hepatic veins dilated. Just a reminder, uh, central venous pressure does not predict volume responsiveness, except at the extremes. If your central venous pressure is zero to two, then you can pretty much assume that patient will benefit from volume if they were in shock. And likewise, if the central venous pressure was greater than 20, then the chances that they benefit from volume are low. But in between, your guess is those mine. How do we measure the stroke volume? What we're interested in is, does a change in preload affect the stroke volume? And the change in preload comes from the changes in intrathoracic pressure during, during tidal breathing. Here we're gonna talk about delta Vmax. So if we measure, if we place a Doppler gate across the aortic valve in the outflow tract, and we measure the deflection, the downward deflection on this Doppler curve represents a stroke volume across the aortic valve going away from the probe. And here you can clearly see, even without measuring, that there's a significant difference in the stroke volume across the respiratory cycle. We can measure Vmin and Vmax and put it into a formula, Vmin, Vmax minus Vmin over Vmin. And if this is greater than 12%, then it's been shown that these patients tend to be volume responsive. In an obvious case where you can eyeball this and see that it's clearly greater than 12%, the measurement is not absolutely necessary. Another thing we can do is, is trace the velocity timed integral, both the minimum and the maximum, and also put it into the same formula, min, max minus min over the mean. And in this case, if you have greater than 20% volume uh, change, then that those patients tend to be volume responsive. The distensibility index describes basically the change in the inferior vena cava over the respiratory cycle. Here are the examples again of a collapsible IVC and a non-collapsible IVC, and it's one that is in the interim situation. And here if we put the IVC max minus min over the mean, that number of 12% comes up again. And it's been shown that the, if you have an IVC distensibility index greater than 12%, those patients tend to be volume responders. Qualitatively, we can also look at the papillary muscles in two different views. The first view here on the left is the apical four-chamber view, and the view on the right is the parasternal short axis view. Here, if you identify the papillary muscles, posterior median and the anterior lateral, posterior median, anterior lateral, you can see that essentially during systole they are touching each other. And so you're obliterating the cavity. And this typically represents hyperdynamic states such as hypovolemia and uh, distributive shock. We underutilize the passive leg raise often, but in a patient, especially a patient with the, an arterial line, it's very useful. Well, let's say you have a patient with no arterial line and you want to see if raising their legs will increase their cardiac output. Raising the legs from a 45 degree angle down uh, of the body down to supine with a 45 degree angle of the legs held passively a one, provides a one minute auto bolus of 300 to 500 cc's of blood. It's low risk, it's reversible, it's been validated in diverse populations including atrial fibrillation, ventilated and non-ventilated, and here, if you find a 12% change in the Vmax or the VTI from sitting up to laying flat with the legs elevated, then that predicts a 15% change in stroke volume with a fluid challenge.
Now, if you're incorrect and there's no significant change in Vmax or VTI before and after, then no harm is done. You just put the legs down and raise the body, and you haven't challenged a patient who has a full tank with an additional fluid bolus and caused any issues. So we've assessed whether the tank is full by looking at the heart and the inferior vena cava. We also want to see if there's any leaking going on. These are some of the views of the FAST exam, Focus Assessed Transthoracic Echo. The view here is the Morrison's pouch correlating with B on the chart. Here is the diaphragm where you can see the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity um, where they meet. On the right we have the splenorenal recess or C and the bottom picture is D or the retrovesical pouch, pouch of Douglas depending on the, the sex that you're discussing. These are normal examples. By comparison, when there is free fluid, such as in a trauma patient where the assumption is that free fluid equals blood, you can see that on these views. Here's an example. In this patient, here's the kidney, the right kidney, and the liver, and this trace, this triangle of black fluid in between that's not uh, within a viscous, it's outside the viscous, we know this from its sharp corners, that in a trauma patient would be blood until it's proven otherwise. And on the bottom picture, an example of free fluid behind the bladder is right here. You can clearly see the wall of the bladder and the fluid within the bladder, but then there is a black stripe of fluid behind the bladder, extra outside the bowel. And again, in a trauma patient, this is blood until proven otherwise, so in a shock patient, this is a very important picture to obtain. What other um, issues are we talking about? We've talked about the pump and the tank. But we need to not forget about the pipe. I think this is the step that is most often neglected, especially in the ICU. There's issues of overlying bowel gas, issues of obesity and body habitus. But with patience and with um, consistent pressure, you can often get a good view of the aorta. Here's a view, the spine here, aorta, IVC. And what you want to do is find the aorta near the xiphoid and tra trace it all the way down until the bifurcation. And you're assessing to see if there's any outpouchings or saccular aneurysms or dissections even. Um, now this is not the definitive test for any of those, but this is a screen again in, in shock patients, and if you see something that seems abnormal, then the appropriate follow-up test is called for. We typically look for the aorta to be around two centimeters, and again, the centimeters are over on the side. Here's some examples of some abnormalities. This initially was seen. There's some opacity inside the lumen, so when turning in a long axis, you can more clearly see that there is a flap throughout this aorta. So in the shock patient that you find this in, the appropriate clinical situation, you know what to do. This particular patient, we also did um, a bedside echo of the heart, and this is parasternal long axis view, and what we're seeing here is signs of aortic insufficiency, aortic regurgitation. You can also see a very wide aortic root. But if you pay attention, you would also be able to see a dissection flap and that descending aorta. The other pipes that we need to think about, the femoral vein, the popliteal vein, the places where we would get deep venous thromboses. So if you have a shock patient, say who has uh, signs of right ventricular strain and appropriate clinical scenario, and you look in the legs and you find a non-compressible femoral vein or popliteal vein, then this very much helps you in your diagnosis and your therapeutic decision making. Obstructive shock are the processes that physically impair cardiac output. Again, we're going to talk about a few of these. Pneumothorax, pericardial effusion, pulmonary embolus, abdominal hypertension, compartment syndrome, um, massive pleural fusion, and hokum with SAM. We don't have example, examples of each of these, but these are the types of things that we can see with ultrasound. Um, and you would need to be thinking about in a patient with shock that you're performing the rush exam on. Here's an example of pericardial tamponade. 
So this is a subcostal view with the liver at the top of the screen and the heart in the subcostal view. You can see the layers of the pericardial sac separated by a striped black fluid. You can also see a hint of uh, diastolic collapse of the right ventricle. Pneumothorax. Here you can appreciate in an upright patient the line of the pneumothorax, but in our supine patients it's very common that we do not find a pleural line and that anterior air is often missed on a chest x-ray. Here's an example of what ultrasound uh, pneumothorax looks like. This point, the specific point is called the lung point, and it's 100% predictive positive for pneumothorax. On the left of the screen, we have a pneumothorax. We can see the skin and soft tissue. We can see the pleural line. But we see no activity or sliding at that pleural line. And then we have these air artifacts, or A lines. Whereas right adjacent to it, in the same pleural space, you can see sliding of the visceral and parietal pleura. And you do not have the A lines. In fact, you have some minor B lines. The only thing that can do that is where the lung drops away from the wall in, at the point of the pneumothorax. If you were to do M mode across these two sides, you would have a stratosphere sign, or an old-fashioned barcode sign on the left, whereas on the right you have the seashore sign where it looks like waves coming into a sandy beach. Again, there have been studies, many studies, that show that for supine patients, the trauma patients are typically supine on a backboard, chest x-ray is at most 75% sensitive for picking up a pneumothorax, and some studies as low as 50%. Whereas ultrasound is in the high 90s for sensitivity and negative predictive value. Massive pleural effusions can also create shock. Here we have a situation where you have massive pleural effusion compressing the lung against the heart. This is a short axis view of the heart, and the heart is actually on the right side of the thorax that's being pushed over so far. So when this patient had their fluid drained, their shock improved. Abdominal compartment syndrome can also cause the same thing. Here we have a cirrhotic liver, and we have the diaphragm and the fluid around the liver. And this patient had a bladder pressure in greater than 30, and they were in shock. And when a large volume paracentesis was performed, their blood pressure improved. Here's an example of what a pulmonary embolus may look like. Again, you can see the right ventricular dysfunction. It's large compared to the left ventricle. You also have the tricuspid annular plane not moving a nice two centimeters towards the apex. You don't see much of a change in the size of the chamber. And you see something called McConnell's sign, which is a hyperdynamic apex with a uh, right ventricular lateral wall that's fairly akinetic. And in, some, in this study, the original study from Mitch McConnell, 77% sensitive and 94% specific for PE was this sign. However, it's important to keep in mind that patients with right ventricular infarcts were excluded from that study, and that can also appear such as this. In this particular patient, a PE was suspected, so a deep venous thrombosis evaluation was performed quickly at the bedside, and with downward compression, there was a non-compressible femoral vein and a DVT. And since the patient was too unstable to go down to the CT scanner, uh, we were able to initiate treatment at the bedside quickly. Here's an example of something we don't see often and you need to be thinking about in certain situations. We often miss this diagnosis. So Hokum with SAM. This is a slowed down version of a heart that has a very small left ventricular chamber and a disproportionately large septum, especially um, proximally. So in patients like this, often uh, little old ladies who have long-standing hypertension have gotten dehydrated, um, when they go into systole, their anterior leaflet of the mitral valve can become adherent to the septum. Here's an another view of the same patient. And at the beginning of systole, if you freeze the picture, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is kind of suctioned against the, the um, septum, which impairs the uh, aortic outflow tract and instead creates a situation where you have mitral regurgitation, such as here. These patients will often present hypotensive with pulmonary edema due to the acute mitral regurgitation. And the natural tendency is when you have a patient who has pulmonary edema is to give them Lasix.
However, in the situation, this situation was set up because the patient was hypovolemic and their chambers, <coughs> the walls of the chambers became too close during systole. So the therapy for this type of pulmonary edema is to pr provide boluses of fluid until the walls of the septum and the walls and the anterior leaf of the mitral valve did not approximate each other so closely and therefore the mitral regurgitation will go away. This patient also showed diffuse pulmonary edema as seen in the right image and a completely collapsible IVC. And this is often the combination that you'll see. So anytime you see a patient with pulmonary edema but a very other indications of hypovolemia, consider that they might have a situation of acute mitral regurgitation from this physiology. So to summarize, the RUSH protocol is a rapid ultrasound in shock. It's just a suggestion that when you have a patient in shock that you approach them in a protocolized way. You think about the pump, think about the tank, and you think about the pipes. You evaluate the patient systematically and you look for sources of shock. You could also look in terms of high MAP, heart, IVC, Morrison's pouch, aorta, veins, and pleura. And again, it doesn't matter which method you pick as long as one works for you and that you undergo it systematically. A few cases. Case number one, 65-year-old man with a known poor EF who had been in a nursing facility with Clostridium difficile colitis, multiple days of diarrhea and poor PO intake, presented with hypotension and dyspnea. The ER bowl is two liters of fluid, thinking that the C. diff was a predominant etiology, and there had been no improvement in his MAP, and his shortness of breath was about the same. So you're called to, and asked, how much more fluid should I give this patient to resuscitate them? And what comes to mind should be, well, what kind of shock is this? Is this hypovolemic shock truly, or is it cardiogenic shock, septic shock? You would treat them all differently. So in evaluating this patient, you can appreciate the poor EF, which was known as a baseline. But when you look at the inferior vena cava, it's completely full without any collapsibility. This is after the patient's gotten two liters of fluid. You can also see diffuse pulmonary edema. So the answer to this question of how much more fluid is needed for this patient's fluid resuscitation is no more fluid. So the patient was actually admitted to the CCU for congestive heart failure exacerbation. Diuresed and was placed on inotropes and did very well. Case two, 50 year old woman, shortness of breath at home, complained to her daughter who soon thereafter found her on the bathroom floor unconscious. Paramedics arrived and she was apneic with a thready pulse and went into cardiac arrest in the ambulance. In the emergency room, these were the images that were obtained. This is a subcostal view, left ventricle and right ventricle, the right atrium right here. And what you can appreciate is a free floating thrombus right there. On this side, you have, this is the eight, this is a parasternal long axis view, which is angled to get the right ventricular inflow tract, and the atrium right here with the free-flowing thrombus. You can also appreciate in both views that the right ventricle is very enlarged. Visible thrombus in the right atrium, right ventricle enlarged, pulmonary embolus. The patient arrived to the ER, and, but she soon thereafter died. and this was a peristernal short axis view. Very enlarged right ventricle, flattened septum, left ventricle that's essentially empty. Case number three, a one hour bedside lesson for medicine house staff was given one afternoon in the ICU. We practiced obtaining the subcostal cardiac view and we really only focused on what a normal heart should look like. We did not go into any pathology, but that night one of the residents who was in that lesson was called for a patient who was hypotensive and decided to get an image. This is the image he got. He didn't know how to record the image, but he took an iPhone video of the screen and texted it to me and asked me, is this what I think it is? And indeed he was right, this is pericardial tamponade. Initially the patient was um, thought to be septic and was, had been started on antibiotics and given fluids, but within 20 minutes this view was gotten and the appropriate path was corrected and a cardiology fellow came in to um, 
address the situation and the patient did well. So the take home point here, bedside ultrasound can rapidly assess patients, both safely, non-invasively. We can be doing this and we should be doing this according to our professional societies. We will be doing this. This is the way that medicine is going. So now is the time to get comfortable. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me.